Um, do you want to bring up the lightning timer on that one? So I figured what we'll do is we'll go until we either run out of time or run out of people. We've got seven up here, 7535, we should be fine. So left to right we have Chris Mean first. He's going to talk about CodeCraft. Awesome. What? You don't want you to hear two. from me twice. Yeah. <laughs> Make it go. Do you want to use that instead of uh, a lip on? Yes. Are we going? I'll, I'll start anyway. Why don't I get my extra few minutes? Um, I... <laughs> Go on, Tim. Uh, as, first of all, my name's Chris Mean. Um, I'm a local Dunedinite, Dunedin developer. Um, in the last couple of years, two years ago, we started a developer group, um, which everybody who's worked in a larger centre is probably aware of, well aware of. Um, and uh, we meet monthly, have people there. So the first reason why I'm standing up here giving a lightning talk is, are the people from Dunedin in the audience who don't know we exist? Anything? We have that? Right. So we've got, we've got a couple. Okay, so uh, first Tuesday of every month at the Centre for Innovation, which is just over the road, and we have two or three people talking about uh, much the same sort of topics that we're hearing about now. So I would highly recommend you come along. And I highly recommend you tell anybody else in Dunedin that we come along. The second reason I'm standing up here is just to start inquiring uh, about groups in other parts of Dunedin as well, uh, New Zealand as well. Um, it's, it's been a revelation, I think, uh, coming back. I, I worked in London for a long time, 96 to 2006, come back, and I could honestly say I was terrified of coming back to Dunedin. It was like, what on earth is going on in, uh, in this very small city? Um, and it was great to have those groups. And what I'm quite interested in is whether there are similar groups in Vicargill. I'm intrigued. Uh, there's some interesting stuff going on there. Christchurch, obviously. Other things. Um, so that maybe we could uh, at least know about each other. And maybe we could even, if people are passing through, we've got uh, people from Dunedin has a, a sort of a bit of a homework and network. And we've got people from Canonical, Mozilla, all sorts of things like this. Um, and it would be interesting uh, if people... I guess us going to Christchurch and then on to Auckland is a more realistic. You guys coming down to Dunedin and then flying off to LA, maybe that's not going to happen. But it would be great to hear from you, hear whether uh, that sort of stuff exists. So catch me at dinner or at the pub. I'd love to hear from you. OK, on to the next one. I just read the small print on the bottom of this. It says, if you don't see a video, get Chrome. See who's next. We have Daniel Mile. Here we go. Using Python to predict if you will go crazy. I'll let you start while I try to see if this works. Do you want to switch? Yep, to Mac. How do you switch? Uh, uh, no. <laughs> Tommy, come to the machine. Touch the screen. Oh, it's touch screen. Okay, so I'm Daniel Mile from the New Zealand Brain Research Institute, and today I'm going to explain a project that we're working on. This is an association with UNC Otago and University of Canterbury as well. We're all living longer. Now, there's a problem with that in that by the end of our life, one in two of us is going to have some form of dementia at the moment. So what we're trying to do is predict who is actually going to develop dementia and then give them drugs to try and stop it from occurring. So what we do is we put people in a brain scanner and we get different types of brain scans. The one on the left there is just a grey matter scan, so it shows you your neurons. The one in the middle there, the green line, sort of around the white area, is your connections between your different brain areas. And the right image there is showing the blood flow in the actual brain. So the way we do this is we tag blood as it's coming up through the neck, and then we can see it emit a particle when it goes to different parts of the brain. So once we've got all this data, for each person, we get about a gigabyte 
of imaging data. And we also have some neurosite testing and some other things as well that we throw in. And then we put it into Python. So we're using PyMC, we're developing a predictive Bayesian model that takes all this information, segments it into appropriate areas, works out the probability and then outputs for a person. So we give it a bunch of people, we know what's happened to them because we've done brain scanning for several years now and we know who develops dementia and who doesn't. And we give it some of this data which it learns from it and then we test it on a separate group of people. So on the bottom plot there, well, I'm showing you the result of what happens when you predict for these test subjects. So the green ones are the ones who do not have cognitive decline several years after the scan. And you can see the model puts most of those as a low probability. The ones with orange are the ones who have mild cognitive impairment. So these are the people who are on the way to severe dementia. And you can see that the model gets some of them sort of middle probability and high probability of converting. And then the red ones are the ones who are actually demented. And you can see again, they're in the middle and high probability areas. Um, and those ones there, we're looking at the range of drug treatments that we can use at the moment to actually try stopping this occurring in other people. Python's excellent for this. It allows us to integrate a whole bunch of things together quite well. And we use it in several different areas and it really makes our life so much easier and makes the grant money go so much further. Thank you. Do we have two minutes to go? Once this will reset. F5. Next we have, no name, Python in real world. <laughs> That's a very ambitious title. Um, I'm probably not going to live up to it. Right, Windows. Now you use the Windows one. That's Mac. That's PC. Okay, um, I'm a structural civil engineer, so I don't have a lot of programming experience. So what you're, I'm going to talk about is, you probably think I'm a script kitty. I think this stuff is awesome. So please uh, bear with the simplicity of it all. Um, civil engineers use Excel a lot. Now Excel is really good for a lot of things. Um, it's not so good for others. I like Python because it complements Excel. It has things like Lambda functions. It's repeatable, you can rerun a Python file from a CSV file instantly without having to copy and paste into all the stuff. The problems I've found with it are getting it peer reviewed by other civil structural engineers. Usually they're not too familiar with programming languages. And so getting them to check what you've done is right is difficult. And also we deal with bridges and large structures and it's commonplace that someone's going to have to come back and look at what you've done in 50 years time. And if they can't sort of immediately follow your train of thought and where you've derived the loads from and everything else, you, you know, you haven't done it right. And so if you just have a whole bunch of printed scripts, um, that can be difficult for that as well. Um, two of the projects that I've used Python for, one's a cement powder silo. It's at a port in Jurong in Singapore. It's, it's huge. It's 80 metres high, 25 metres diameter. I modelled this in a finite element program and I found the user interface of the finite element program quite clunky in terms of getting out a lot of data. For instance, you can see this is the wall of the silo. I wanted to find out the maximum and minimum values of the stress in that wall in half metre sections all the way up 60, a 60 metre high wall. That's a lot of pointing and clicking with a mouse driven user interface. Python can get me that from the CSV file of results instantly. Um, that's like six hours work into two seconds. This is, for instance, this is the, uh, the foundation of that, of that silo model. So you can see the, uh, the stresses in the top and bottom of that. Um, I, don't have, I don't have to pick those out graphically. I can dump my results into Python, get the radial coordinates and plot those out myself. Um, so the more interesting project is a, was a sugar storage shed in Queensland. It's, again, it's large, it's 300 metres long. The wind uplift given by the structural design codes is quite conservative. Um, it means that the steel on the roof would have to be much heavier than it, than it can be. Wind tunnel tests were done on similar sized sheds in the 80s, but all I had was a PDF file, a yeah, PDF document plotting their results, like a contour plot, and no sort of computer-based data. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to interpolate that onto a plot of pressure along the rafters on this roof. So the way I did that, uh, that's like, a, a sh when, when I say shed, I mean something like this. The cyclones in Queensland tear the roofs off these things regularly. 
So this is not the contour plot I had, but it was like this. So I, I scanned this into a CAD program, I traced around the contours, I outputted points every 300 millimeters along the contours to a CSV file again. I then used a Delaunay triangulation in Python to get me what looks like what, uh, this. That's the, you can see the contours turned into a triangulated surface. I then generated another grid along the rafters. So, and then I used um, something I wrote myself to interpolate the values of this triangular network along the grid. What I did was, you start from the first triangle, the, the network has given you a data structure of all of the triangles, all of the coordinates of their vertices and which triangles are adjacent to which others. So you pick one to start, you get the barycentric coordinates of your interpolation point and you find out if, whether or not that point's inside that triangle. If it is, it's as simple. If it's not, you jump the edge of the triangle to the triangle that's, uh, it's, it's, you jump the edge that like if the point is over here and my starting triangle is here, I jump that edge to this triangle, then maybe I jump this edge and this one and I follow that path all the way to my interpolation point when I get to the point, triangle that the point is inside, you do an interpolation. And that will get you something that looks like this. Those are the rafters that have been interpolated along that surface there. Um, yeah, that's it. So again, I would have hate, hated to have done that by hand with a rule and a pencil on this, on this plot and try and, like that would have taken me all day with this algorithm, it took me a couple of hours to write and it graphs like this and um, it results in about Raft is about 60% of the weight of Rafter's design just using the code, which saves hundreds of thousands of dollars when the client comes to build one of these sheds. And I think that's awesome, so yeah. An, an engineer's experience with Python. Thank you. Next we have Elliot talking about Python desktop apps. Probably. Probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll just talk while I'm going to put something in. PGA. PGA. Space. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say start. I'll say start then. Go. <laughs> that was the that was rule, wasn't it? Uh, it is, but we've actually got copious amounts of time. And I'll, uh, I'll just put it in there. I have a feeling we're going to have leftover time at the end, so for those of you sitting there thinking, start thinking about, what, what could I talk about for five minutes? Is that, you? <laughs> uh, is, is that me? Yes. yes that's you. So you Oh, Christ. Or you need to go into displays and mirror. <laughs> Do I? Where's my still display? Is it that one there? Uh, no, that's just another desktop. Oh. Uh, Using Gnome Shell, aren't you? I can't uh, help you. No, I can't help myself either. It's... <laughs> I'm doomed. Okay. Well, I'll just talk. It's not going to work very well. Elsewhere? No, because it's, <clears throat> it's just a whole lot of web pages. Um, so what I was going to talk about is that uh, with the, um, there's a lot of emphasis on the web these days, but there are still a few desktop apps out there. And uh, so if anyone knows how to work Gnome Shell, you can come down here and <laughs> get something on my external display um, while, I'm, while I'm talking. Yeah, <coughs> someone from, so, um, there are a number of desktop apps that are written wholly in Python, and uh, not <laughs> not look at that. So, at the moment, I'll just have to mention them. One is called Gramps, and it's a genealogy application. So, if you're into genealogy, it allows you to put in your ancestors and all import stuff from other people, like people who collect genealogical information. There we go. It's in the background now. Uh, like the Church of the Latter-day Saints, for instance. Uh, and so here's, here's, here's its user interface, uh, or it allows you to produce reports and that kind of stuff. So, oh, in general, one of the things about these apps is that they're written in Python, and so you being Pythonistas, you can hack on them. You can feel good that you're running Python behind the scenes. Also, if you want to enhance them, you've got a chance of actually working on them if it's not um, you know, a language that you're comfortable with. So submitting bug reports or writing plugins. So this one here, there are a number of plugins for producing different kinds of reports. And so Gramps for genealogy. Uh, Gourmet. Uh, 
is a recipe manager. So if you're into cooking, you can get recipes either off the internet or enter your own recipes in. Again, written in Python. Uh, got a plug-in architecture, so if you want to do something cunning like add pricing for catering, you can go and hack on that. Uh, the other thing you can do is if you're new to Python, these are sizable apps that are written in Python that you can go and look at the source and get some ideas about how to do their cunning GUIs if you're you know, wanting to get started on that kind of thing. Here's another one which has always interested me, but I've never quite been able to get into, Leo. It's a complete editor written in Python. It's, I kind of get the feeling it's a bit like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's along the lines of a religion like Emacs. It's like, it has its adherents and it has people who don't really get it. But again, a substantial IDE editing application, completely in Python, completely open source, so you can see how things have been done. One of my favourites is Pytone, which is a MP3 jukebox, has a fantastic UI, you know, great graphical um, attributes there. The nice thing about that that's not visible is that it has, if you can, if you have a computer that has two separate players, it has an audition player that will play uh, whatever you've got selected in your library and you can listen to that on headphones while the, the main player is playing your party, uh, party song. In this case, the author is a fan of Neil Young, so that's what it's playing there. Um, another place you're going to encounter some Python on desktop is in uh, scripting for other apps. This one's one that interests me is Wireshark. <coughs> you should be able to write uh, dissector plugins for Wireshark and Python. Now, the last time I tried to do this, it didn't work. There were bugs in it. And I spent about a, nearly a week hacking on that without a huge amount of success. So I probably need some TLC uh, if anyone's interested in Wireshark and writing their plugins in dissectors in Python rather than in Lua or having to compile C dissectors, then uh, it's probably worth working on and making it work also for the profile of Python. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Cheers. You got a question? Yeah, just rip it out. Rip it out. That's Linux, it'll be fine. <laughs> now we have Marek talking about the Jabber API demo. What? It's not, it's not working. Does that mean you do not want to talk about it? You're not even going to wing it. I'm going to start talking really slowly because we've got half an hour and two people. <laughs> Software patents. Lawrence is going to give us a talk. Um, arranged you arranged to be last. Chris, again, why we should teach Java or C Sharp in schools? And I, I, I'm, I, exactly. <laughs> throw, it, throw it down. That, that, that was sort of the point, uh, I think. So just to give you background, I um, am currently doing some work at the Polytech, one day a week, mentoring Polytech students, uh, running the CodeCraft group that I already told you. And as part of the CodeCraft group, I got approached by um, somebody at John McGlashan College and said, come and look at what we're doing. We'd like your input. And it was terrifying, to be honest, what was getting done in schools. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm Also, just before I carry on, I want to apologise to every educator and every school teacher and everybody. They do such a hard work, incredibly difficult job. But I, it, it is hard work doing IT education in schools. Um, the thing, why I titled what I wanted to say, do it in Java, do it in C Sharp, and we're obviously going to have somebody who's going to come along and say we should be doing it in Python, is I've already had a numerous conversations with people here last night at the pub that sort of have this reflection on how they learn to do programming. Um, so we've, I've talked about people doing Logo, people hacking away on ZX81s, you know, we're all showing our age here, all this sort of stuff. But um, the general thing is, is this was actually enjoyable and this was, this was fun. I've looked at some of the stuff that's being asked of students at schools 
and they're doing relational database theory and some of the most boring stuff known to programmer kind and this is what we're asking people to learn and do at schools. So why I titled stuff, we should be using Java. Anybody guess why we should be teaching Java at schools? We should be teaching them Android programming. We should give them a handset and they should do some little app that they take out into the, class, into the, into the school and they should try and do something with it. C Sharp, why not get Windows going down the, going the toilet, get them to give schools some Windows Phone 8 things and do the same thing. Uh, maybe why should we teach Python at schools? Um, I think a very good thing would, why don't we buy a whole pile of Raspberry Pis and get them to do something with Raspberry Pis in school. So I, I think it's that, that reflection that it, it's sort of gone for whatever reason, uh, the technology syllabuses have come in. One quote that I found very interesting, I'll have to, oh, there I can go for ages on my hobby horse. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I found quite interesting is, is that in the United Kingdom, they're doing a big review of IT teaching and they've sort of come to the conclusion that it's, it's not working is the general thing and, and it's being discussed, should we actually take the syllabus and rip it up and do something else? Uh, and one of the quotes I just saw is, maybe when we rip it up, we shouldn't replace it. We actually put more people off programming by teaching it at schools than we capture uh, in schools, which is quite a terrifying thought. Um, and another thing that I found fascinating was I studied at, at, at Targo, 94 is when I graduated, and that was one of the largest comsci courses there was, and it's sort of gone down, and there aren't as many people doing it, yet there's more and more and more IT work to be done and it's going that, you know, there's, there's just going to be so many opportunities, yet it's not getting, not getting done. So the other thing that came from the quote talking about, uh, talking about how we teach it in schools is can it actually be expected of high school teachers to do it themselves? Uh, it's, it, how hard is it to keep up with IT yourself in your own job when it's your profession, when it's all you're supposed to be doing? Incredibly difficult. How is somebody supposed to do that as a school teacher when actually you're supposed to encourage, you're supposed to mentor, nurture, all of these things? So I think that in some ways uh, there's an obligation on us, certainly. It, it's, it's nice to see in Dunedin that some of the people who are working for some of the bigger organisations are going into schools and, try, and trying to help out. But I think there's that, that sort of thing that, um, you know, I now have young kids, so that's what I'm sort of looking to do in my kids' school. But I think there's a real need if we want to encourage people, I've, I've already had the discussion, um, people seem to not quite know how to do programming when they come out of university. Uh, duh. <laughs> it's not surprising because they don't do it and we don't teach it and we don't help and all of those things. And, and I think over the coming years, I think there's a real, uh, the problem's not getting easier to solve, but um, how people run internship programs, how people uh, contribute to groups uh, here, conferences and, and interact with kids, you know, it's now got to the stage where we can, as an individual, you can, you can once again build some really cool stuff in the comfort of your own home and we don't want to sort of crush that message to the next generation of programmers who come along. So uh, well done to anybody who chooses to teach IT in schools. Good luck to them. Thank you. you should, I was going to say, if you definitely want to go last, we've had another offer. But now, if you, do you want to go now? Well, as you said, depending on how much interest there is, might take a bit longer. That's all. It's a lightning talk. You've got five minutes. That's right. Well, we'll see how we go. Yeah, we'll see, see what people think. I'm going to click start. Okay. Well, um, I used to work in high-performance computing before um, switching careers to IT IP law, so you might think of me as going over to the dark side. But what may be of interest to people was that um, in 2008, 2010, the government decided to revamp the patent uh, bills in New Zealand, and after we found out about a secret meeting between Microsoft and IBM under NZICT. Um, there's a lot of outroar, and as a result of that, the Ministry of, e of Economic Development said that, OK, we'll give you guys two options. A, allow software patents only in bedroom computing, but not elsewhere. Or B, uh, we'll just forget about software patents. 
And the healthy outcome at that time was that, OK, we're not going to have any software patents. Yeah? A big win for open source. However, just last week, the minister of the National Party said that, OK, it's time to do the second reading. We'll just finalise everything. Here's a few minor corrections. One of the corrections was that you know, software um, is not patented as such. And you might think two words mean nothing. But that's like saying a semicolon in C is nothing, or the comment column in Fortran is nothing. Those two words effectively negated the whole concept of not having software predictions that everyone had agreed upon uh, t two years ago. So effectively, they didn't just move a field as uh, goalposts, they completely shifted the um, playing field. So we're at a stage now where in one week time, on the 11th of September, the government will be voting to um, do the second reading. And usually there's one more, but that's a formality. And there, the second reading, the text of the legislation will be set in place or not. So as you may expect, this has caused a bit of an upset among the open source community. And yesterday, we were discussing how, what we can do about it. And we've come up with one solution, which is we want to um, alter the text in the proposed legislation to more accurately reflect what was agreed upon back in 2010. So we are going to try to you know, um, contact as many different IT organisations, people, individuals, um, anyone around New Zealand who wants to ensure that the government sticks to its promise of what they said back in 2010, that no software patents were going to be permitted. And as such, we're going to be, over this weekend, I'll probably try and talk with various people, but what we hope to do is set up a website, which is <coughs> softwarepatents.org.nz, where we're going to be asking people to see, to endorse this uh, correction to legislation to more accurately reflect what was agreed upon two years ago. And at the moment, the website, all we got is the main name. So if anyone's got a bit of interest in so contributing a bit of time to do a mashup of various things, because some organisations, although they can endorse it, individual members might not. So in some sense, it's a bit like a preference vote. But the goal is that over the coming week, we want to try to raise awareness that this change, it's only two words, really means negating the promise that the government made two years ago. And we might say to the government, stick to your promise. So this website hopefully will be used to collect uh, people's um, um, endorsements. And we want to show the government that New Zealand, that software patents is bad for the industry. I can actually talk you know, quite a lot longer about why, but uh, we've got other people waiting. So it depends on what kind of interest there is. Thank you, Lawrence. This might even work out. Do you want to come up and do a talk? Yeah. We've got Tim McNamara. He's going to give some entertaining talk. Yeah, hopefully I can uh, lighten the mood slightly, right? Uh, so we just had a wonderful discussion about IT and Python. Uh, this is a Raspberry Pi. They exist. And there are some really interesting things that you can... Uh, do with not much money. I also helped out with the One Laptop Per Child program here in New Zealand, and that is in basically an operating system mostly written in Python. And if you are an educator that would love to be able to make things more fun and entertaining, there are options for you. But the one thing I wanted to talk about mainly uh, was to just to share some experience. Uh, Grant is up in the back, I believe, and there he is. And Robert was here earlier. Uh, there he is. And we held a Python workshop for beginners as volunteers that was actually extremely well attended. And one of the things that has sort of come out of that is 
should the Python community, as a, as sort of a national body, be more pro be more sort of should we actually develop some sort of program to be able to give people a vehicle to use Python at work and. Uh, one of the concepts that's been discussed is we could have you know, sort of semi-regular beginner's workshops but then maybe have like a GIS stream or a scientific or technical computing stream and then maybe a, I don't know, maybe a web stream. And just not so much, it's, it, you know, you can only teach so much in sort of six hours but can you get people to open their eyes and, or could you prov open the door to experimentation, and I just thought that I would raise the possibility of the, the, the Python community being able to create something more regular, and possibly as the user group, we could uh, sort of create something. So uh, that is my time, uh, I'm sure, and I will pass the, the baton on. Okay, thank you. So Merrick, now or do you need a few minutes? because we've uh, got Francois. Francois. All right. <laughs> Francois is going to come up. So what, <coughs> sorry, what I'm going to talk about has, is what might be of interest to any Python web developers that we have in the crowd. Now, if you're a web developer, you've probably, you probably know about cross-site scripting attacks. Um, they suck because when you write your little um, sort of web forum thing, people inject evil JavaScript like that, and then it does something like this, right? Not cool. Um, or they put you know, some kind of... Uh, Thing like this, and of course, what happens when people visit a page is something like this. So, how do you prevent XSX attacks? Well, people use templating languages, um, things like that, uh, which will st clean um, HTML code for them, uh, and then they turn on auto escaping, which is great. But um, turning on auto escaping by default doesn't mean that everything will be always escaped because you always have to let through some kind of HTML in your application. So it's easy to forget little things and, and then have evil things happen on your website. Um, the real problem is that browsers actually default to letting everything through, right? Every sort of HTML will get, ran will get rendered um, by the browser and executed if it's JavaScript. Wouldn't it be nice to actually be able to change this? Well, you can now with content security policy. The way that it works is that you can get the browser to enforce the restrictions that you want on your site. And it works on all of these browsers. Um, and it looks like this. So it's an extra header that you add to your uh, website. So, the, it's a, so it's a response header. And you have something like, well, default SRC self means that by default, you uh, will let through any content that come from the same domains. In this example, it would be httpexample.com, uh, but nothing else. So, uh, and then you can specify per sort of content type, like images, you can say, OK, it can come from the same website or from the data URI if you like embed images, base64 encoded images into your CSS file, for example, or things like that. Um, so if you have this example, what happens is this. Nothing happens. The JavaScript is not executed. And you can see in the Firebug console that uh, the CSP uh, directive blocked the JavaScript. Um, so unless it's explicitly allowed by your policy, inline scripts are not executed, right? So that means that people inject evil stuff in your application, you forgot to filter it, the browser will not execute it. So, big win. Um, however, it means that your inline scripts are also not executed. So basically, you want to remove inline scripts in your application. Um, similarly, images like these won't get displayed, and then in Chrome, that's the warning that you get. Um, so external resources are not loaded unless you want them to do. You can apply your policy to all of these things, all of these tags. And if you want to prepare your website for CSP, 
first thing to do is to remove all the inline stuff because there's no difference as far as the browser is concerned between your inline scripts and an attacker's inline scripts. So just get rid of it. For example, if you're doing something like this, um, just move it to a file. In eliminate um, JavaScript URI. So if you have something like this, where it, your link will call a function, just um, do something like this. So set up explicitly the on-click event. And I want to stress that this is not a replacement for proper XSS hygiene. You do need to filter your inputs, all of that good stuff, use templating languages, but it is a great tool to increase the depth of your defenses. And if you want to know more about it, you can read up on there. And if you use Django, as always, there's a plugin for it that will do it for you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now you may have noticed a bit of organization going along here. Does anyone have a MacBook video converter? Let's see. All right. This is why I like normal hardware. <laughs> so hey, I've got the mic. I can say whatever I like. I can do a five-minute talk on why Apple's evil. <laughs> but I won't. Here we go. We have an adapter for your adapter. Well, we'll find out in a minute. Do you want to? <laughs> this is laptop too. Do we need to balance it? Okay. Whoa. <laughs> it's saying that there's no signal. Yeah, yeah. We're trying to see how many connectors we can get in a row. Okay, I'll start talking anyway. Just start talking. Yeah, so um, I somehow made this working just like now. <laughs> uh, so I've got um, Arduino here with solid state relay. So Arduino controls solid st state relay that is um, duct taped to one of these. <laughs> and um, <laughs> uh, sort of a couple of years ago I wrote... Um, uh, Jabber-based API daemon thingy that you can write JSON, <coughs> JSON type sort of API messages or just the usual text and, and kind of as a real world example obviously if, um, I've wrote one of these uh, so you write a command, you write your own commands and then <coughs> through by serial um, I control Arduino state that. Uh, so I can pretty much use these elements as um, home automation elements. Um, to write anything really. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, this is very... I, Completely did not prepare this at all, um, as you can see. Perfect. Uh, to find out more, I've got the code open source on my Bitbucket account, so who is interested, there is, um, I gave a talk at the local uh, user group. So it's uh, pretty much Python Jabber bot that uses PyXMPP, and, and you can write your own commands to it with a full authentication, so obviously I don't want you to talk to my bot, to talk to my Arduino, to switch on my lights in the shower. <laughs> so it's got like an authentication and everything. It's open source, and you can find it at bitbucket.org slash uh, shivak slash chabot, and, um, which I will tweet shortly with a hashtag kvpycon. Thank you very much. Very unorganized, I know, but this is it. <laughs> All right. That's the end of the scheduled lightning talks. We've got about 10 minutes before the start of the next track. 
Um, I have had people ask me what I'm talking about in 10 minutes in the other room uh, because it's not on the schedule. Um, it, it's a talk I had lying around. It's on solid design principles. It's not really a Python talk. Um, so if you ignore the C++-isms that are occasionally slip into the talk, um, it's about object-oriented design principles. Um, and that'll be on in 10 minutes starting in track two. So we can either take a break or someone can scream out a topic and we'll do theatre sports style lightning talk. God oh, damn. <laughs> Okay. Come on down. Hi, my name's Glenn Ramsey, and I, I was just talking with Grant at lunchtime, and I was telling him a story about something I was doing at home, and he said, that'd be a great lightning talk. So I'll tell you the same story. Um, at home, I, um, my daughter is allergic to chicken eggs, and so we, we live on a little farm, and so um, we were raising chickens, and... Um, um, the chickens are pretty good at, at, um, at raising their babies and that, so that's all right. So you, you end up to have, have lots of chicken eggs and lots of chicken to eat. Um, it turned out that my daughter, after a lot of discovery, we discovered she was um, allergic to chicken eggs, but not duck eggs. So we switched our uh, poultry to ducks. And um, it turns out that um, we didn't want to have that many ducks, but we wanted to have some to, to eat. And um, if you've ever raised poultry, you'll know that it's not that reliable. So if you want, want babies, then... Um, Sometimes the hen will sit on the nest for... Ducks take, chickens take three weeks, so it's not so bad. Ducks take four weeks, so um, if the duck sits on the nest for two and a half weeks and then gets scared by a rat and gets off, then you're in trouble. So the solution to this is to have an incubator. And so um, you can buy one from, trade me, I think they're about $400, but if you're an engineer, you'd rather make one yourself. And so I, I have um, been through the process of building one and um, I've got a little box with some lights in it and stuff, and I needed to control it with an Arduino. Well, I wanted to control it with an Arduino. And, um, and being involved with Python, I thought, well, um, um, that, it would be nice if I could be able to program my Arduino in Python. And I, I've look, looked around the, um, the internet, and I couldn't find anything. And so this talk is more of a... Um, uh, I'm soliciting some um, um, advice from you guys. And you can come and talk to me later if you know the answer to these questions. How can I um, get my Arduino programmed in Python so that I can control my incubator? And um, I, I guess this, this dovetails in with the um, fellow who talked about education. Because um, uh, to me, the, the thing that I enjoy about computing and what me got, got, got me into it was that you can, um, um, with the ZX81, you can do some simple stuff in BASIC and make it draw stuff on the screen. With an Arduino, it's, it's even, uh, to my mind, more engaging. You can connect up some wires and some lights, write some programs, and, and have it work for you right there and then in a, in a few minutes. The only problem is that uh, Arduino, you have to program it in C. And the, um, the, the difficulty with that was, was brought home to me because I, my father is an instrumentation engineer, or, or a retired instrumentation engineer, and I, I bought him an Arduino for Christmas last year. And um, he hasn't actually unpacked it yet. Well, he's unpacked it, but he hasn't looked at it yet. And, um, and I know that when he gets and starts, starts trying to program it, he's going to come unstuck on the first day because he's just not going to understand the C stuff. And I was thinking that if we could do that in Python, it would be so much better. Uh, and uh, for, for, for new users, because Python will be just so much easier than C. So looking around the internet, I found that there's a really neat thing you can do with Python where... Um, um, you, you can program the Arduino in Python, but it's not real. There's a, a module you can get where uh, someone's written uh, something in C, which you load onto the, Pyth uh, onto the Arduino, then you import uh, a communication module, and so it will execute, I guess, commands on the Arduino to turn on and off the ports, but it's running Python on the computer, and then when you've sorted out your algorithm, you have to hand port the Python into C, um, so that you can get it into the Arduino, which is not really an ideal sort of a workflow. So doing a bit of investigation, I discovered that, well, I thought, well, what we really want is something that will translate Python into C, and then we can compile that with the Arduino toolset and stick it down onto the Arduino. And it turns out that PyPy, the, um, you know, the fast uh, Python implementation, has a thing in it where it will translate the, the, the restricted version of Python, which is perfect for Arduino because Arduino doesn't do much stuff anyway um, in terms of the sophistication of the language, 
So we want to translate from R Python into C and then get that into the, into the Arduino. And that's been an idea that's been milling around in my head for a while, but I'm not sure how to join all the bits together. So if somebody uh, uh, has any ideas or even wants to sponsor someone to uh, investigate that and implement it, then um, come and see me. Thank you. OK, thank you. We've now got about just under five minutes before the start of the next session. So feel free to move to track two and listen to me.